we at Manchester United, we were going to win every game. And similarly with Wayne, you know, he had an issues with Wayne and we would have big discussions about Ronaldo because there was rumours around. We always felt that he would move probably to Madrid at some stage, you know, 80 million payable up front in our bank account. How close were we to getting Ronaldinho? I didn't get a good vibe. If Barcelona hadn't been there, we'd have got them. Dave Brails was doing an audit at the moment with Jean-Claude Blanc. Brailsford has shown, albeit slightly different sports, you know, that he's a winner as well. Mr. Woodward. Uh, you know, and I was available, but I think he wanted to plow his own fire. It's a vibe with five, vibe with five, and you already know this. Right, guys, welcome to Vibe with Five. We are here with Joe Bell, Steve Harrison, but forget them, forget me. This is about Mr. Gill. This is one of the most respected voices in the game. Was the CEO at the football club, Man United, when I was there. Done great things, set, and many of the foundations that uh, kind of led to us being successful. And I've been badgering him for years to come on the show. And here we are now. He's, he's actually gutted he's here. He almost done a U-turn on the way, but we got him in the building now that the door's locked. Welcome, Mr. Gill. Nice oh, to yeah, see you. Very nice. Thank you How for you the doing? invitation. Yeah, good. I only, I only did a U-turn because you gave me the wrong directions. Yeah. Well, I would do... I wasn't going to answer that. <laughs> it was a bad start. I was that nervous. I no, gave you the wrong direction. No, but you all right? Yeah, very good. Yeah. We're no, good. good. Yeah. Do you know what? Let's get straight into it. I mean, like, I'd love to know, like, what, how do you feel? What's your feelings about your time at Manchester United when you was there? When you look back, the success and everything that we had? Well, when I look back, I think the most important thing was the enjoyment. And it was a privilege to be associated with the club. Um, you know, I actually sort of uh, said back in the... I was a Manchester United fan. I said in the, uh, uh, when was it, sort of around you know, late 70s, my dream job was to be finance director of Man United. Never think it would come around. Then it came around in 1997. I got the opportunity to move up. I was living in the south of England, move up and join the club and as finance director. I was previously finance director for a tour operating company. And to get into the game was brilliant. And then the Premier League had been going, what, for five years, the game was growing. I saw the opportunities there were, were sort of, um, how should we put it, you know, pretty impressive. And so, you know, I went up there, quickly got given new responsibilities and then became the deputy chief executive in uh, 2000. And when Peter Kenyon was lured to Chelsea by Mr. Bramovich in 2003, I was offered the job of uh, chief executive and stayed with that in 10 years. So when I look back, it was fantastic. I mean, it was a privilege to work in sport. I think a lot of the people around, if you love sport, you know, to get into it is brilliant. And people would think, you know, what does, uh, what, what does it mean? And so I would look back and say, we achieved a lot, but it was really good fun. Is it the winning that you love and miss or, or, or you, you think about, or is it the profits that you generated? No, it's the time? winning. I mean, I think we always had, and I think it's important in football generally to understand, you know, it's quite unique or sport's quite unique because mm. it's, you know, you've got a balance between it being a business and a sport. If you go too far, the business side you're going to make mistakes you go too far to the sports side you're going to make mistakes mm. so it's that balance so ultimately we at Manchester United and most clubs I believe understand that what happens on the pitch drives everything because if you do well on the pitch that uh, the way the football finances are structured you get more money in and that money mm. is largely profit be player bonuses and things <laughs> like that but largely profit and you reinvest that back into the pitch into the players into new players or players contracts into the training ground into the ground in terms of capacity sponsors follow and that virtuous circle works so you've got to have a winning team you've got to have a team mm. that's sort of up there challenging hopefully winning trophies and for me that was the best thing actually winning a trophy was you know phenomenal and you, you could see the tangible efforts that you put in in terms of obviously with the manager and his scouts and everyone you know putting that team together and they're actually coming off was, was fantastic mm. so uh, you always knew if you win the rewards are going to come mm. it's as simple as that to me and i think as i say if you focus too much on the business and Worry about that. You're going to make mistakes. You used to like the parties as well, didn't you? The parties. I love the parties, Rio. I remember <laughs> those moves of yours. They were fantastic. <laughs> no, but I think that was good, as you know. I think what we did at Manchester United, we, we every time we got to a final, we had a party. Yeah. Um, obviously, you had to prepare for that in advance of knowing the results. So there were, there were some good parties, and there were parties that perhaps slightly longer to get going because yeah, we yeah. lost the final. Whatever. They ended but up good as well, though, didn't they? they? Fantastic. Yeah. Well, they ended up good. And I think always thought this because I remember every, the following day, the players, the scouts, they, you had a bit of a break, deservedly. And I knew that then it was a very busy time Transfer. because of the transfers. So I'd wake up with a headache or whatever. And think, oh, I've got to go out and try and do this deal, that deal, or, or mm. whatever. But it was, they were great. And not only were they sort of 
obviously all all members of staff, and I think they still do this, all members of staff were invited to the a cup final and mm. things like that, which was good because ultimately, you know, football clubs are you know, very small in terms of numbers, big in terms of brands, and it's a matter of making sure that we look after everyone the same. Mm. I, I always get asked about that because your name comes up in alongside Sir Alex Ferguson a lot when people are discussing the past and my mm. time at United. And mm. I always go go back to a moment that we had, we used to have like a bit of a leadership group mm. uh, in the change room, like Nev, Giggsy, myself mm. and a couple mm. of others. And I, ne uh, I always use this as a story that I've mm. kind of encapsulates who you are and how I see you is that we were moaning about having to do too many hours a week mm. or a month commercial work yeah, yeah. This is when the commercial started generating more of money and, mm. and so there's obviously mm. more time comes mm. with that yeah. and I was there guy we were going oh, this is out of order we're not getting paid for our time anymore mm. and we're having to do this the club are earning so much more millions mm. we deserve a piece of the pie mm. and then we called a meeting I think with you didn't we mm. and, and, and we, you came to it and you sat down and you just let us all rant mm. and we're all given our 10 pence worth and at the end of it you went um, guys with all due respect you guys your contracts now you're okay to be like mm. that, but anyone who signs mm. from this point in the small print in mm. that contract will be mm. that there's a designated amount of hours that you have to do. Mm. So if you don't like it, you don't sign on mm. again mm. and renew your contract. If you want to renew, that's going to be in there. Mm. And we all just shut up, we just wow. sat there and went, okay, <laughs> we want new deals. Because it's, it's a balance <laughs> Rio. Yeah, exactly. It's a balance Rio. And I think that's right. And I think, you know, ultimately, you know, it's things like that, that you know, we understood or I understood with Alex or Alex of education, you know, what you players had to you know, be fit, ready for the game, motivated and all that. So it was about getting that balance right. Mm. And so it's little things like, you know, and the, you know, getting a private plane for certain players to come back after international duty. Mm. You know, say, well, we used to love that. Yeah. Mm. But you say, you know, it wasn't necessarily in the budget. We say, well, Alex says, we've got a big game Sunday. We've got to do it. You just do that sort of thing. Or to, Manchester United has a fantastic pitch now, but believe you me, before you came and probably after you came, the pitch wasn't that great. Mm. So towards the end of the season, you say to uh, you know, Alex to say, we need a new pitch, you know, and you say, well, actually, you know, that's three quarters of a million pounds or there or thereabouts. But you say, well, right, we'll find the money for that because mm. that could be another three points. Mm. That could be the difference between winning and you know, not winning the league. Mm. And so you know, those sort of things come in. So I think as long as you understand you know, that, that what happens on the pitch drives it. I think you, 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 you've got a good starting point. And that's mm. all, all, always what we try to achieve. Mm. You just spoke there about something that was quite amicably besotted with Rio, but mm. I know he was never a permanent good boy. Talk to me about some of the times <laughs> where you've had to butt heads against him. Well, not against Rio. I think Rio, Rio was always very polite, as you can see with that Mr Gill. But I think ultimately, you know, I, I, I would sort of, with certain players, you know, you, you'd have some issues. But by and large, I was I was sort of removed of that because Alex would, I'd have butt heads with Alex and things like that. And, make, you know, and we'd have our disagreements or this, that and the other. But ultimately, you know, if Alex had certain issues, there were you know, there were certain um, things that had to be sorted out. Like Alex wasn't happy with some of Rio's private investments at some point, if you remember. But yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> but they, they were just sorted out because ultimately, you know, uh, you know it, was, it was about, you know, getting the team <laughs> focused, getting the team prepared and ready to take on the new challenge. So, and I, but I think, oh, I always said with these things, I, say, I, I would fall out with Alex that, you know, it, and we could have some quite sort of heated arguments, but, you know, ultimately we were both doing it for the right reasons, i.e. because we wanted Manchester United to win, and we, we, this was for the good of the club. It wasn't his, it, for him personally, it wasn't for me personally about what was right for the club. And the, and the important thing, I think, in any organisation, whether it be on the pitch or off the pitch, is challenging people and not being afraid to challenge people. Is then how you move on from it and and uh, uh, and uh, don't carry it around as a sort of a grudge or anything like that. And that's what we've tried to do. In some of the fanzines at once yeah. about one of Rio's contracts. Yeah, there, there, there's always a case. I think you know there's certain aspects. You know, I think contracts are probably more difficult those days. But over the years, the certain players went very very quickly. You know, we look at Edwin van der Sar. Edwin would come in. You know, with his lawyer, his agent, and we do it in an afternoon. And, and, and I, quite, I, quite, I quite like that, actually, because he sort of, A, it was done quickly, but B, he could hear some of the points I was making, you know, about what the club could afford or what the position was or what our views were. And it, he sort of heard it and he was bad enough to say, I understand that. And, you know, a bit of toing and froing, you got it done quickly. But other players were more difficult, without doubt. I wouldn't put Rio in that category. You know, Mine was yeah. about three months. Yeah. <laughs> three yeah, months. Yeah, 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 but, Edwin yeah, a day, I was yeah, about yeah, three yeah, months. Yeah, exactly. This Mr. Gill thing, where does it come from? Obviously, we're all showing you respect as you come in here, etc. But 
I think without even meeting you, Rio has always had, mm. he's always had a, a great image of you mm. to the point where mm. there's no there's no other name that we can call you. If you can, ex- <laughs> I, I don't know, I don't know how to go about it. But where did it start? Well, it's a legacy of football clubs because right. you know if you look at football clubs, and this is before my time, it was all, the chairman was Mr. Chairman. Okay. It wasn't mm. Mr. Martin Ebbers or Mr. This and the other, or and uh, you know, Rio, the secretary is Mr. Uh, Mr. Merritt and things mm. like that. So it's a legacy of that. And I think, you know, out of it, you know, Rio just did it. Gary Neville used to do it. Phil Neville used to do it. More, more of the English players, not necessarily, the, I don't think Nemanja ever called me Mr. Gill, but, <laughs> you know, the, that sort of thing. So I think it's a legacy of that. And Rio just keeps it on, even though sort of, uh, you know, he's, he's uh, long, long since retired and we have a different relationship, but, you know, he's done that. So that's what it's at. Not, notwithstanding the fact that I've, yeah, you know, I always tell him to call me David, but he doesn't. But that's fine. <laughs> I like so that. I, I yeah. think it's there's a lot of respect, and as I say, that that's the history of football clubs, really. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and you mentioned, obviously, you're talking about contracts here, etc. When you came in, you have a um, Steve's let me know quite a lot mm. of information. He's mm. a massive United fan. Uh, you were one to take the commercial levels to another mm. level mm. when it came to Man mm. United. How did you prioritize that? What, are you sitting down going right? These are the areas that we're going to focus on player sponsorships. How does it go? Well. I mean, as I say, go back to the players would be the crucial part so in, in the first instance. And, but, you know, that's the driver of it. So, you know, I would be working with Alex, you know, throughout the year, although the transfer windows are clearly two periods, we would work throughout the year to look at the out, you know, what the player outlook was like, what the contract situation was like, what the youth team were coming through, what the scouts were looking at. So always planning for that and then getting the action together. So out of that, we had a quite a sort of, uh, I, we instituted, instituted sort of a, a, a ratio of 50% of our total turnover, our total revenue, could be spent on play, on wages, total wages. So the players, the manager, the coaches, all the off-field staff like myself, etc. And if we if we felt if we were around that level, then that would be we'd have a very sustainable, very well-run cup because it would allow us allow us to retain profits, would allow us to reinvest in the business, get new players, and still be attract the best players and which is the main thing so they're still doing that now i think there's probably a guideline uefa brought in some rules which i won't bore you with today because they are quite complicated and and whatever but they are trying to look at that but i think that's the ultimate thing the thing about football is is there's enough money coming in it's how it's spent yeah yeah. and we we and so then but in answer to questions you had that then the commercial side or the ticket sales and everything like that we had good people in all of those areas driving and running that to make sure that we um you know, we could, you know, deliver and increase those revenues because every pound of revenue extra we brought in, mm. you know, it's 50 pence could go, you know, mm. we, we could say go, go to players and attract the players. So it's, it's, it's all of those areas. And I think what's happened at uh, Manchester United, our, our vision, so to speak, was to be the best football club in the world, both on and off the pitch. And, you know, you never achieve, you know, that's a goal. You know, it's a bit arrogant to you don't achieve it, but that's our goal. So in order to do that, we have to have not only the best players, the best manager and coaches and whatever, but also the best um, people in their, in their different areas, whether it be on the commercial side selling, whether it be on the, in the finance team, whether it be in the legal team, whether it be in the, the ticketing team and, and executive sales and events. So it's all of that, bringing it all together. And with that focus of saying a lot of money coming into football, how do we generate more? And therefore, how do we, which enables us to put that back into the business, which is the, which is the football side. Well, I had that vision on it and completed it. That's unreal. Mm. I, I wouldn't mind going back into the business side. There yeah. was something you just said there that I think we have to drill into a bit. Mm. You said you sat down with Sir Alex and I assume one of the chief scouts. Mm. Was that the, the team deciding transfers and targets? Yeah. Effectively, yeah. I mean, ultimately, Alex had the say. And then, you know, we, we, we worked together. So I, I would have a, a, a normal sort of, I'd have go to Carrington every Friday, um, you know, that would be a formal thing, go through with Alex, which would go through, depends on what was happening at certain times of year, go through what was happening on the players or go through on his issues and we'd meet for an hour and a half or so, two hours, go through that and we'd have a fairly simple sort of, you know, uh, set of documents which looked at each of the player, traffic light system, you know, what the contract situation was, you know, what the, uh, you know, uh, various other things, you know, and, and the youth team coming through, will they make it, won't they make it? And that would be the driver. And then Alex would be good at assessing it and determining you know, where we need to look at. He'd give the, he'd give the direction to the chief scout and the, the scout to look, uh, look uh, you know, for replacements or look at issues and then come back. And ultimately, you know, coming into the summer, obviously sometimes in the winter when we bought, say, Patrice and Nemanja, but by and large, we try to do more of the business in the summer. 
we, we would he would say right those, those are our key targets and then it was up to me it's changed slightly now because sporting directors have come in mm. and the, the whole um uh, how should you put it uh, those areas are expanded clearly, but I was doing those deals, you know, and I'd have legal support if necessary. And this so you'd reach other. out to the club. Yeah, reach out to the club, and exactly, and, and contact them. Phone call, chairman. To yeah, 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 just saying what you know, what's interested, what's going on, and then you know, it's, and each deal was sort of the same, but also slightly different. You know, and and, and there are certain players who might be competition for and more difficult to get. Clearly, other players we knew we would get to. So, for example, yeah, no, but you know, the, the, the sort of uh, I remember the, just on that as a funny story because Peter Peter Kenyon was the chief exec at the time, and we were looking at Rio, so we made an offer for um, to, to lead. Peter Risdale was the chairman at the time, and uh, you, you probably heard this story. Anyway, so I went over to Peter Kenyon's house, which is in 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 the sort of uh, in the Cheshire countryside, and Peter Risdale was coming over, and uh, so Peter we'd faxed him an offer for for Rio and. Uh, Peter Ridsdale responded, "Well, that might buy his right leg," and that was it. You see, so wow. so each each different, and, I, and 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 I think you know you, how you use the agent, how you work with other clubs, and this, that, and the other. But it was that was the basis of the of, of the way we're doing. But ultimately, to your question, Alex had the full, you know the final say quite rightly, and he was the so expert. It seemed like what would now be four or five different people's jobs. Uh, well, I think it's certainly expanded and things like that. I think I don't, again, you know, it looks like, you know, certain clubs have much more of a you know, collegiate way to, to, to determining who comes in and, and, and this, that and the other. And then you have a sporting director working, presumably with a finance director, with a legal director to put it all in. And that, whether it's because it's more complicated now or, or whatever, I, I don't know. But uh, ultimately, you know, that was a key aspect of my job was to actually bring someone in. And Rio was always very interested. I used to get these texts. Hi, Mr. Gill, who are we bringing in? Who are we bringing in <laughs> during the winter? And I said, mm -hmm. which is good. Because I, I mean, two things. One, I couldn't tell him because, you know, whatever. But B, it demonstrated, you know, to me, the players were really interested, wanted to know how the team was improving, what we were doing. And that's what we wanted. You when know, did that players. negotiation begin? You, you don't wait till the window opens, surely. No, no, it, it depends on certain ones. You, you know, you complete it. No, some, some of you may do. I mean, it depends because it was always fluid. But you, you, the actual detailed negotiations and buttoning it down was sort of could be after. So, for example, you know, Michael Carrick, for example, we bought, bought, bought from Spurs. I spoke to Daniel Levy. We'd identified him, but I spoke to him at the Premier League meeting that summer, early doors, early, you know, when it was early June, uh, and said, look, we're interested in Michael. And as with Daniel, it took three, three months to do, but we got it done. So, mm. but, so each of them are different is what I'm saying. And, and you, you can prepare them. And, uh, but, I feel so late still. No, no, we would try to do it quicker. Yeah, we would try to do it. We'd have our ducks in a row. So we would, we would know what our strategy targets, was, yeah. what the targets were. We'd have, you know, the approach we were going to take, the broad parameters of the deal, whether it be on the player wages, whether it be on the, the, the transfer fee. We had rules on agents, what we would pay agents at the time, which we adhere to. So all of that. So you, it wasn't as if you were starting straight away. You had the ducks in a row, but actually then triggering the, triggering the process might be delayed. It, it depends. It's, it, it would be slightly easier because that's a... You know, when it's a domestic transfer, I think it's slightly different to a foreign transfer because mm. like, you could easily ring up another club, you know, uh, in, in Spain or Italy and say about it. I don't think that would really impact the two seasons. But, you know, we you know, suddenly rang up, you know, Spurs, you know, with four games to go and say, what about Michael Carrick? It might be a bit more problematic, I think. It's yeah. matter, I, I, talking, going back to your point about asking about players, we mm. won a Champions League. Mm. And just as I was walking into the party afterwards mm. when we were in 2008, mm. I saw you, didn't I? And yeah. I said to him, look, come on, Mr. Go, who are you buying? Yeah. I need to know. And you went like, just go and have a party, man. Like, so, <laughs> go and enjoy it. And no, I was like, no. just give me one, please, one. No. <laughs> that was when we brought up Berber and Deadline Day as well. Yeah. yeah. But I, I, I like, you know, as I say, I like that. And I think if you look at the character of the players there, not necessarily as, as sort of open as Rio, but a lot of them, you know, I'm sure they're all very interested mm. in what we're bringing in. Yeah. The, the best players that like the squad to be strengthened, mm. you know, mm. and they like it to be, they like to be challenged, and they always want to know how, who's going to come in, who's going to get better. And the best players, I don't, well, you, you would know much better than me, you can tell me, I never felt were worried about their place or their number mm. of games. And with, in the way that Alex Ferguson managed the squad, the sheer number of games meant you were going to get, mm. you know, there's a certain, certain 11, but all players will get a, Good, good slug of games mm. during the year, wouldn't they? There was a good mm. core of players who Correct. probably knew they were going to play. Yeah. And they would be the ones probably that would drive wanting to know and wouldn't be yeah. fearful of who's coming when Correct. players on the periphery would be like, okay, hopefully someone yeah. will come in my position. Do you mm. know what I mean? What's your most proudest moment whilst working at Manchester United? Uh, well, it depends. I mean, 
the most, the best moment I think was, you know, was uh, for, was lots of winning trophies. But the best one was in two thousand and seven when we won the league and we hadn't won it for a while. Mm. And I think, you know, because as a CEO, we come in and, uh, you know, I think we were, you know, we hadn't done it. So to win that was fantastic. So that was great. But all the trophies were great. I loved winning the trophies and having mm. the parties. And then the rest was just, you know, I think we continued to develop the club in terms of, you know, the staff and things like that. And I think, you know, we, we had some you know, good good initiatives there. I want to quickly elaborate on that. Did you ever feel at one point that it was going to be hard to come back to the top when Abramovich came in and you know, Pierre really. is there because no. they're spending all this money. They were, but yeah, you know, we 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 got some of that for Veron and some like that, so we did quite well. <laughs> so, no, but I think it's, that's a good thing about football, isn't it? It's always competition, and I think you know it means that you know there's always going to be it's, it probably even more teams can win the league now than pre- previously. But I think the very fact that uh, you know you, you, we haven't got a league like you know. Germany, although Leverkusen is doing quite well this year, or, or PSG or whatever, I think made it made it very attractive. So I think all that did was, you know, it was effectively you know, um, galvanise us and, and make sure that we sort of worked even harder to do well. So, for example, I remember when I, when I joined United, and you know, uh, and you look at the number of points we won um, to win the league in the late is like you know seventy six, seventy eight. Mm-hmm. So we, I remember Alex saying that effectively, if you if you sort of um, get two points a game, i.e., win your home game, draw your ways, you're going to be there or thereabouts, and you, and that was it used to be the norm. Now you get teams winning with ninety odd, and we had to change. And Alex mm-hmm. always felt, you know, you can have a you know slow slowest start. And we had to hit and we had to hit the ground running from August, you know, to win the league. So. I think competition is great. You learn through competition and you develop it. So this is a yeah. selfish one. This yeah. one, I just want to know. What's your thoughts on uh, how Arsenal are redeveloping? Obviously, since Arsenal Wing has gone, we went for a little bit of a lull. When you're looking from the outside in. I don't know. I don't... You don't care. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah he's stuck in the trophies yeah, yeah, on top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, think, I, I think they've done some good player deals and things like that. And mm-hmm. things like that. No, I think, no, I think that... <laughs> No, I think Arteta. He doesn't I, care. Yeah, I, don't, I don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> this is Mr. May United here. Yeah, yeah, talking yeah, to. yeah. I don't really care. Oh, My last no. question, Mr. Gilbert, no, right, no. before we go, is: is uh, we we won the, we won the double. We won the, the Premier League and the Champions League in two thousand and eight. Right? So I don't know that tune. And <laughs> yeah, you, 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 you what the double one? Yeah, FA Cup and Premier League. Yeah. And I remember getting on the plane. I was in a bad way, a hangover, by the way, and. Be, I just remember being told. We, I remember asking. So, what's the route we're taking on the uh, the open bus yeah. tour, open top bus uh, tour? And I remember being told there isn't one. Mm. I was like, what? Why, why didn't we have a, 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 a tour? The council were, were. It was Rangers, wasn't it? Yeah. You can't yeah, win the Rangers, Premier League yeah. and the Champions League yeah. and not do a it's tour. Than I agree. Rangers I mean, in retrospect, you did it, but I think they're much more organised now. Manchester, you know, perhaps at the time more difficult. We should, we should have done it. I agree. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I can't, I, don't, I can't remember the exact reasons why we didn't do it, we shouldn't do it. Yeah, they're more organised now because yeah. they only have to have them one deep for City, yeah. so it's not that oh, hard, yeah. is it? <laughs> they have three stewards yeah. and four cones out, it's solid. <laughs> but I think, again, back to your point, aggressing, just working for the club is brilliant. Yeah. I wasn't good enough to play football, I played, you know, as a lad and this and the other, I wasn't good enough, so mm. to actually work in it and combine, you know, that and whatever, it's a, it's a privilege. And I think, you know, people say to me, or if someone came to me today and I was, you know, 25 years younger and said, look, you, you can join Man United, even with it, I said, fantastic. Mm. I mean, you know, in, you, until you get in it, you know, everyone's interested in it, or sport in particular, uh, you know, and uh, Manchester United's place in that. And I tried it when I was there. That's why I worked with the FA, worked with the Premier League, worked with UEFA, because Manchester United should be outside in these bodies trying to, you know, affect how the game's going and be influential and be involved. So to me, you know, uh, I, you know, it was, it was, it was all great. I couldn't. It's difficult to pick out one or two particular things, but winning trophies, you know, seeing other staff develop and just being involved day to day, I used to love it. Talking to Sir Alex Ferguson, the boss, um, and you spoke about biting heads and mm. arguing at times. Like, what what, what were your standout characteristics for you? Do well, you? I think that a couple of standout ones. I think one, obviously, he was a winner. I think two. You know, his contact base and his knowledge of football was encyclopedic. And I think that was one benefit we had going back to the point about scouting because he had a lot of tentacles around. We would have a scouting structure, clearly, but he would know enough people, say, in Germany to speak about a player or this, that and the other mm. because of his relations he built up. But B, 
you know, I, you know, people used to say to me, you need a psychologist in Manchester. I said, we've got the best psychologist. Why do we need to employ a psychologist to bring that in? Mm. But I, 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 just, I thought he was just his sheer positivity and his you know, belief of winning. I remember when I go into matches, and I was going back to the point about um, on uh, Friday mornings, I go in and see him, and we'd be playing Liverpool that weekend away, or City, or a big game in, in, the, in, the, in the sort of scheme of things in the league. Well, not Arsenal, actually, at the time. No, it wasn't. No, but <laughs> wow. You, you, no, you go in, and you know, I'd be a bit nervous, not nervous, but you know, apprehensive about the weekend, particularly the away games. I'm much more confident at Old Trafford, but some of the away games, and we were going to win every game. No, you go in, and I'm sure that came to the yeah. players. He ne I never went in, we can beat them this weekend, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to do the other. And, and I think that's a great skill to have, you yeah. know, that sheer belief. And obviously we didn't win every game, mm. but hopefully we won more and drew, and drew more than we lost. But you know, that, I think that was a real sort of thing. And I think the other key thing for me, and I, I tried to do it myself, is he was a decision maker. Mm. He wasn't afraid to make difficult decisions. And it's easy in life to go along, you know, it's okay, we'll see how it pans out. But I think you've got to make decisions. You've got to say, you know, well, actually, you know, do the analysis by all means, check it out, but then actually go ahead with it and not look back. And I don't think he ever, he ever made a bad decision mm. in his own mind. He clearly did, but he never made one because he was always looking positively about it. One of those decisions was like Bex. Yeah. Like, even that situation is a tough decision yeah. because he's such a big yeah. personality at the yeah. football club and has yeah. the image, etc. Yeah. Are you, are you just this waiting for the guidance of him, or are you input as well? Or? No, he, on those sort of things, he would ask, and I mean, you know that that was fine. You know, he not to ask me, but I was, Peter Kenyon was the chief executive at the time. He'd have discussions with the board, and he let them know. And similarly with Wayne, you know, he had an issues with Wayne, and we mm. would have big discussions in terms of, you know, at one point, you remember, and yeah, so we had discussions, and he'd speak to me about that, and I'd point out certain issues. I remember doing a decision tree to sort of try and help. Did the you want? To, was you going to let him go? No chance. <laughs> but that's, no, but, but, but that's, so I think that was good. And I think the other thing is, you know, he could recover well. You know, I don't know, you know, again, you know, uh, after a tough weekend, he would sort of, um, uh, you know, he would uh, uh, come in, I think, really positive about the next game. And really sort of, you know, and I think that spirit and sort of looking, lifting everyone, because you lose a big, big game you're all a bit down but then to come in on the monday or whatever and and look forward to the next one i think it was very good so and i think all of that and as i say his, his knowledge is encyclopedic to this day about football and you know about players and things like that so it's it's it's, it's quite funny i just I, 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 just one quick funny story to show the enthusiasm alex ferguson you know when we lost to real madrid and nani got sent off in 2013 oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and and we knew it was going to be Alex, oh, I knew it was going to be Alex's last season. And so we, we, we didn't send him out to, to, to do the, um, to do the uh, post-match conference, uh, press conference. And we sent Mike, Mike Feeder out, even though UEFA slapped us with a fine. But we did that. And uh, it was that Turkish referee, you remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So come the summer, uh, it was, you know, August, it was a Champions League playoffs. And um, I, was, I was in London. Uh, and the, uh, the phone rings, it's Alex. He said, you're watching the, the playoff. And I think it was PSV versus someone. And I said, no. And he said, he, he says, guess who's refereeing? Yeah. I said, <laughs> and I said, I probably can guess his yet. And he still can't referee, he said. <laughs> His language is a bit more choice. <laughs> but, you know, that's my point. So, that, he's still got that. So that's, yeah, yeah. I think that's right. And I think, you know, that, that whole winning ethic. And if you don't have a football club that actually, you know, you know is there, wants to win and you know and, and that's its goal then you mm. might as well give up did you ever receive the the famous hair dryer treatment yeah a few times <laughs> yeah uh, no but yeah again but i can give something back no perhaps not in the I, mine was probably not the biggest hair dryer but it was yeah. <laughs> but i th i think that that's fine and i think you know it, you, alex is very black and white as we know and but i think you know my my point is he doesn't bear grudges and you go out in the room and he ring up and he might throw a bit over the top there and apologize and you move on so that's to me you know, as a mark of his management style and, and, and things like that. And I think, you know, so in other words, knowledge, uh, experience, intelligence, he's a good people person and being decisive for me, of, you know, what I would categorize him as. Um, the Roy Keane incident stands out as something that he was obviously involved in with Sir Alex, which might actually be a little bit of a counter to doesn't hold a grudge. Mm. Um, <laughs> but did Roy Keane and David Beckham both have to go? Was that important at the time, or was there maybe other options that might have been better fitted for that? Well, it's, 
with hindsight. Yeah, yeah, with hindsight. I think I don't. David Beckham, I don't know because I think you know. I think you know we brought in Ronaldo and things like that. I think he was he was there. Roy, you know, it was a difficult situation. Rio was around the, the MUTV interview, and I think the decision was made for him to go, you know, there and then, which to me, you know, probably was the right one at the at the time. It was a quick one, wasn't it? A quick, quick decision, one, very quick. But he had to move on. The, the team was you know struggling a bit at the time, so he wanted to make that make that decision. You know, hindsight's very sort of, um, you know, how should we put it? You know, uh, very useful to have. But I, uh, yeah, it, I, could, I could do, being sort of a bit more in the middle, I could probably go pros and cons of both, to be honest. And I, but I think, you know, if I, if my, and I've said this to Alex, my only, you know, um, my, one of my regrets is that they were, they were both so great for each other and to see them falling out, I think it's a pity. I mean, it's on, I honestly feel that they were. You know, he was a fantastic captain, and they, you know, they meant a lot to each other. And you know, for that for that to break down, I think is very difficult. But I think you've got two you know, winning, two highly um, motivated individuals of, of their own mind, and it's come to that. But you know, I think you know we should celebrate what Roy did for the team, which he was fantastic for many, many years. Mm. Do you reckon they'll ever get back? We can sell. I, don't, I can't speak for them. You know them as well as I do, Roy. I've, 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 uh, Rio. I've, like to think so, but you wouldn't say so at the moment. But mm. you know, I think, uh, you know, let's see. Mm. You said it was a quick one. How can something like that be made? As well, a there'll, be issue, there'll be issues in the summer and things like yeah. that. So yeah, I think yeah, we went yeah, on I think tour. You can. Was, That's the point yeah. about football. You've got to make a quick decision and think, move, move on. We were on tour and there was yeah. issues there. There was issues there? with like accommodation and yeah. with the ma mm. management and the staff. The manager, the assistant manager, Carlos Kiros at the time, flare up happened when we were there, and then mm. obviously mm. Mr. Gill gets involved mm. in that, but then. Mm. This situation happened during the season, mm. and it was like a big thing. It's mm. like it could be like a, it could be it's like a pantomime almost. And yeah. then yeah. the next day you come in and it was done. Mm. And I think if you let things, I think this I read Sir Alex's book and he talked about if you let things linger, mm. it, they become a big problem for the squad. You get involved when it comes to players and such. Have you ever had to get involved with Rio? I don't. I know you. For example, the drugs ban. Yeah, you said I yeah. You did. You that, went along that, with him. That, uh, yeah, did. and that was the yeah that was that was a, quite a baptism of fire because that was two thousand and three. Right, I just well, came I in. just came in and t you know, took a, 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 a taken over, so he gave me this hospital pass. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, really. Well, just a little test. Wasn't it's it? very yeah. unfortunate. Yeah, it was, and I think, you know, um, everyone knows that Rio you know, didn't take drugs, and this mm. wasn't a drug issue. But there were, I think. If I look at it, I think you know I, I probably, possibly, or probably would have handled it differently. In would other you? words, yeah. We've never spoken about this yeah. before. And only, what would you have done differently, though? What would I diff What I would have done differently was, I mean, we we were very legalistic in our in our challenge. Mm. We used, um, uh, you know, and I, and, I, and I think I've learned over the years. Sometimes in football, you can be too legalistic, whether it be challenging your UEFA or whether it be doing these things. Sometimes mm. there might need to be it, but you know, our legal. If I look back, our legal challenge, we were very supportive of you quite rightly, and we thought mm. it was outrageous what they were doing. Mm. But I think if we'd have not gone down the legal legal route, which and we were quite technical in arguing against it, mm -hmm. then perhaps, you know, we could have had a more lenient sentence or so mm. or got nothing or whatever. I just think we we went, you know, uh, a bit of siege mentality too early on it. And I think mm. and I know if we come out and say, you know, Rio said, "Look, I shouldn't have done it, which you did. You know, and I, mm. you know, I made a mistake, or you know, and I did it, but nothing there. You, you never know what people do. Now, people at the FA may have had an agenda to, to, you know, get him and get Manchester United. We will never know. But I just think sometimes if you push it too far mm. down the legal route, in it, which is a football football um, on a football matter, you you appeal to people better. Your great behaviour of the time, your service to the club, your country, and the club. You never know what would happen. Mm. So I." You're right. I've just thought about that, but I'm not, I'm not thought about now. But I, I had thought about it over the, over the years, and mm. I, I don't know the answer to the question. Mm. So I think the club could have been very supportive of Rio because mm. we didn't have any issue with it. But at the same time, perhaps our approach to the authorities could have been perhaps a bit more conciliatory, or and, and this another. Mm. It may have got a different outcome because then we, we, we that screwed the season because we went to Wolves, you know, played. Yeah. You know, and then, and that was we, my last game. Yeah, I just come back, flew in from uh, uh, from Monaco. We bought Zaha, uh, not Zaha. Um, uh, Louis Saha, mm -hmm. Saha, not yeah, Saha, yeah. and uh, and then that was your last game. Mm. We lost one 0 remember? It was, it was mad because um, we were top of the league then as well. Yeah. And I, it was um, you did try though because I yeah. remember you drove. We drove down. Remember yeah. we drove down yeah. to um, 
the CEO of the yeah. executive. David, 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 David Davis's yeah. house. And I remember, it was, I felt like a kid, right? Yeah. We walked into his house, the CEO of, of DFA with mm. Mr. Gillon to Alex Ferguson. And they went, right, you go and sit in there, Rio, in this little room. Mm. We're going to deal with this. And mm. they just walked in there. And I just, mm. there was obviously yeah, battling it back and forth. I think there were different agendas, you see. I think he might have been okay, but, you know, there are other people there. So uh, that, that was the unfortunate thing. Because it wasn't, you know, it was, you know, it was, it, it did impact the club, certainly, you know, I think, in the season. Mm. I think, you know, did you ever feel United were made an example of at times with instances like that? Because I find it feels like that. Possibly, yeah, but you never. I don't think you can worry too much about that because you're not going to change it. I think mm. you know, for example, that time I forget the year now, Rio, when Wayne got done at West Ham when he started screaming in the, yeah. in the and, that, and that was ridiculous as well. You know, I know we did all these examples of other players swearing and not getting anything. So I think there was there was an element of that, and so we had to fight our corner clearly. But I don't think you should, you know, chew yourself up on it because one of the benefits of being united, everyone, you know, is. Uh, uh, you know, hopefully a margin and jealous of you to an extent mm. and you've got to do all that. So, But I think, you know, you, 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 you just got to look at these things quite carefully. You spoke about players exiting, mm. Roy Keane, David Beckham, some of the players coming in, Cristiano Ronaldo. Yeah. Now, first of all, how did that go about and what impression did he give you when he walked through those doors? I think the... the I mean, we never really heard of him, had we? Because we mm. played against Sporting, and he came in and uh, you know took everyone by storm in that in that friendly, and we went and got him, and then we developed a very good, you know, in the first game came on against Bolton, you know, his dreadlocks and his teeth, and, yeah. <laughs> and then you could see that there, and I think you know again Rio would we'll see him, but you know I think he was very, you know, from the, from the off and speaking to his agent George Mendes, who looked after him for many many years, you know, they were so sort of how should we put it. He was so, so motivated to be one of the best and to be uh, up there. And I think he was very well managed. So I think, you know, for us to have him was, was brilliant and what he did. And, you know, after the first season, we, you know, in 04, go to cup final, met George Mendes, we, you know, gave him another contract. And George was a very good agent for him, I felt, or we mm. felt, you know, managed him correctly. And we knew, we always felt that he would move probably to Madrid at some stage. And that was, uh, but it, you know, we try, were trying to push out as long as possible. But I think his whole attitude and what he mm. did for the club was phenomenal. How, how did that come about? Because I remember we, I was one of the players that was always talking to him about mm. staying. I'm yeah. hearing you looking to what yeah. might be going and whatnot. Yeah. Come on, man, you've got to stay. Um, and he ends up kind of almost, well, you tell me how it happened in terms of staying that extra year. Yeah, well, I think, you know, that going back, to, I remember in Moscow getting the questions on the, on the outside the hotel on the, off, off that party you mentioned, you know, were a lot of them about Ronaldo because there's rumours around and so and as I say I think Carlos obviously being with Portuguese etc thought he would go at some point and we mm. said well, it was a bit of a shock when there was you know he was um, how should we put it um, indicating he might like to go that summer mm. and we said we can't have that we can't have that so in a nutshell you know um, we agreed that um you know, he would sign a new contract with us, but there would be an exit clause, you know, the following year. If they hit a certain number. They had to hit the number, you know, 80 million payable up front in a bank account, Ooh, and, which nice. was a record at the time. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, this, that was that. So, you know, and, and they had a certain period after the end of the next season in which to um, exercise that option. And then obviously I remember in Rome, we unfortunately lost to uh, another party where it wasn't good. <laughs> we lost it. We lost to Barcelona, and uh, yeah, speaking to George and um, you know, Mendes and his, his legal advisors, Ronaldo's legal advisors, it was clear they were going to exercise it. And then, mm. hey, hindsight on that, how much did we mug ourselves off with eighty million? <laughs> well, yeah, hindsight's very good, yeah. yeah. But, but at the time, it was very good. But you're, you're exactly right. I, I, I agree with everything. But it, at the time, it was great. It was the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But well, to, get 80, to get eighty to get eighty million up front, that's Correct. the key. Normally, yeah. what happens? Yeah. It normally yeah. instalments. Like, yeah, yeah, over yeah. four or five years over the duration of the contract. So, look, mm. it's it's it, you know he was a brilliant player, and we didn't want to lose him. But uh, you know, I think you need to understand, you know, again that if we didn't do something like that, then he would have been upset. He would he would exit, and you know it was difficult. And I think no one could argue with what he did on the pitch for that whole last season. You know, I heard and, a rumor, Mister Gill. I'd like the truth, please. Yeah. <laughs> in 2012, did you go and try and negotiate for Ronaldo to come back? No. Boo. 
Yeah. He's got a lot of these things he says. Yeah. See, and we said well, so. Going back to your point about players and you know Alex and the you know, and the uh, team, Renny or Mick, and decide, uh, analyzing where we'd fallen short that year, the number of goals. So we, that was our we set out to get Mr. Van Persie. Ah, oh, yes. And, and 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 that was it. And you know, so we went out and got him that summer, and you know, lo and behold, we you know, Julie scored thirty odd goals and won the league. Was that difficult? Yeah. What was difficult about it? Because Arsenal didn't, it, it, dealing with Arsenal wasn't too bad, you know, dealing with Ivan Gazidis and things like that, and the player wanted to come and his agent. So I think that was that was all okay. But Arsenal, you know, clearly, you know, no. he knew what he was losing. Didn't he knew what he was losing. Twenty five. And he had he had he had uh, you know you know he did clearly now they get on well, but at the time when they were adversaries, you know, had a difficult relationship with Alex. But in the end. You know, it, it, we got it over the line, and Alex spoke to Arsenal, and Arsenal, and they sort of tweaked it a bit at the end to give them a bit more. And so it, it was, yeah, it was difficult. But that's again, you know, I think going back to your point, you know, we, you know, we, 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 we can't be, you know, clubs can't be seen to be just giving up their assets, you know, easily without mm-hmm. a bit of a fight and things like that. And you know, he knew what he was losing, and we got a great goal scorer out of it. How close were we to getting Ronaldinho? Because I know we we got Ronaldo in the end, which was a great deal for us, but that. That summer, I remember speaking to the manager, walking out to training, and he just looked like there was a cloud over him. And we just, he said, "I've just that missed out on Kenyon's getting." Thing wasn't it? Was yeah, it? but uh, uh, this is—I uh, don't know—it's getting the final thing. But uh, yeah, to me, we were never that close. No. Okay. Well, you know, you could assess it because we were—we were there, and I went to uh, went to, over to um, to Paris when he was there. He met with his brother Roberto Assis, who was the um, his, his agent, and this and other. We discussed it. Then we then we met them. That we being Peter and I met them at um, uh, Manchester Airport, and we went through and you know did all the um, did all the uh, numbers numbers, <laughs> and, and they got agreement on the on the wages and this that and other and what we pay the agent, and then uh, Peter sort of went back to Old Trafford and I said I looked after them and you know made, took them to their flight and this that and other, and I just I didn't get a good vibe. How's it? No, because because they Barcelona were in there, and you know, and yeah, you know, I'd done enough deals or seen them, and I know, you know, it's like when you're buying something, they really want to come, they don't, you know, you get you get something yeah, there, and yeah. I, I just felt that if Barcelona hadn't been there, we'd have got them, but if Barcelona, we'd have got him, sorry, mm. but if Barcelona were there, and that was clearly his first choice, you know, Brazilian going down to Barcelona was, mm. you know, with all due respect, notwithstanding the success of Manchester United, I think, you know, it was uh, that was his first choice, and if, if they haven't come up come up with the goods we we had all the deal done the numbers were done so i don't think it was anything that we did wrong it was just that barcelona came wrong mm. so that's the question we were close but you know no cigar was there was was there any uh, deals that you look at and go that got away man that was one of the ones that i just oh. close and top ones big ones that you think well oh, no, uh, we didn't get all the players that we, we, we wanted certainly Come on, Mr. Give me, give me one name, Mr. Give us a name. We, 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 I, we didn't get one. Oh, 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 there must one. have been a big name that Everyone's you were trying to get. I'm sure. Uh, yeah, exactly. Give, give me a name. I don't one know. I'll, I'll let Fergie say that. Nah. Names, uh, <laughs> it's quite amusing because I'm not amusing, but I, I, you know, I still had a, a sort of a, a small office at Old Trafford. I haven't got any more clearly, but after I left, and just because I used to go and I'd do some work with UEFA or whatever and use that. They, they up from the archives gave came all came all these files, and they were all the because every player that we were after, or any conversation I had, I'd do a file on him. Oh, unbelievable! So Have all you the, got it here. No, it's it's, <laughs> it's, it's fantastic, and I, I, I've got it up there. And um, you know the the uh, if I had a, even I had a text from an agent, I'd, I'd note it down. So I got all the record of everything we got, and I looked at some of these players. And I'd love to tell you what they were. But that, that, it's really interesting conversations and things like that. You know mm. that uh, uh, that uh, we can now, do that in the part two uh, yeah, okay. episode. Okay. <laughs> no, but it's, so I, I would do that. I have a record of every conversation, and that's oh. what I did because every agent who called me, I would always return their call, and, I, and then on the basis that um, you know we may not be interested in the player then, but he. Two years down the line or four years down the line, he may have a player, so he remembers mm. how you dealt with them. So that was good. So that some got away. This was a big moment as well in, in my and I remember speaking to you about this okay. in the summer. I was in Morocco, I'll never forget. Mm. And you called me about it to go and speak to him. Mm. Tevez. Yeah. And he went to City, obviously, and yeah. I think you, you was going to Rio, can we speak to him and, and, mm. and get hold of him? Mm. What happened there? Well, Tevez, we had him for two years, and then we had we had the right to buy him for uh twenty five point five million. 
and we exercise the option, um, you know, to, to you know to do that. But I think you know you would again know me better than know it better than I. But you know, the second season, whereas in the first season it was him, Wayne and Cristiano up front. The second mm. season we brought in Dimitar and things like that. So it was a bit more, you know, perhaps he wasn't in the team as much mm. and this and the other. So, and I think. Ultimately, the people who controlled him, because he was a third, he wasn't owned, you know, by a club. We weren't dealing with a club. It's the people we did the deal with to get him in for the two years, which was fully clear by the Premier League and FA. <laughs> um, you know, they, they, uh, you know, they, they, they basically got a lot more money, you know, by taking him to City, mm. and, that, and so that was it. That became a financial thing for them. And I think if he, if, if Carlos had been insistent on staying at Manchester United. Then he could have stayed at Manchester United because we we exercised we said we were prepared to pay that money for him to stay, mm -hmm. but ultimately if he felt for whatever reason better opportunities at City or, or whatever and you know then it it, it wasn't going to work out because mm. the owners of his rights so to speak and it's not allowed anymore but at the time it was the owners of his rights you know effectively almost doubled their money I believe. So. Uh, and and you go to Rooney and when he was looking at, there was rumours about him going to City and stuff mm. like as as the leader, the CEO, how do you navigate that situation? Uh, well, you have to you have to do it with Alex, but how do you navigate it is basically to sit down with the agent and try and sort something out and, 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 and try to sort of, um, you know, make sure that you know, he understands what he's got at Manchester United, how in terms of his wider role and wider possibilities and work it out and try to come, come to a compromise and, mm. and, you know, show he's now the, the all time leading goal scorer at Manchester United, all these things to try and work through. And sometimes players will say, well, it's happening because we were perhaps in the doldrums. How are we going to build the team up? And you have to you know, explain that, yeah. We're, we're, I think that's what one of his it. main questions was, wasn't it? It was, was um, yeah. But, yeah. you know, ultimately, you know, it's, it, it, things go in cycles in football. Hopefully, for Manchester United, the cycle is going to be up now. But, you know, we, we all, you know, everyone was on the same sheet. We all wanted to improve the team and get winning again. So mm -hmm. he, he, he could see that and buckle down and do it well. Your exit of uh, the club. Do you look at back at that now? Is it with hindsight we keep mentioning? But do you look back at that time and think I've done it perfectly right, or is there a little bit of you know I maybe could have done it differently or whatever? No, I think I think the timing was right because you know, I think you know I think you know I've been in it ten years. Or I've been at the club sixteen years. I love the club in ten years, and I think the old saying it's better for people to say ask why are you going as opposed to why aren't you going, and I just felt <laughs> you know from the outside. You probably people would know a difference, but I was I was sort of you know had a bit less energy in certain areas. So for example, I mentioned that I was you know I always call, call back an agent when they contacted me and this that, and the other. I was getting a bit more you know uh, how should we put it less enthusiastic about doing that. So you can you, I th sometimes you can tell mm. that you know and it's it's it is you know it's a it was a privilege it was an honor it was fantastic but i didn't want to be in a position whereby i just you know not going through the motions because i wouldn't have done that but wasn't putting as much in as perhaps i was done had done in the past and i always think also organizations need um new ideas new people new enthusiasms and, mm. and whatever so i don't you know you, you never know hindsight as we've had in this conversation is great you know and there's there's no, there was nothing like you know being the chief executive and winning a trophy, I can tell you that. Mm. You know, we've won a few trophies since I stepped down. I'm still the director of the club, but it feels great as a fan. But it's not; it isn't the same. And you trust me. You know, mm. you know you're there, so you, you never know. But I, I don't regret the decision. I look forward. I've managed to stay in football through UEFA and other responsibilities. It's not the same, clearly, but it, it's club football because that is clearly the best. But it's nonetheless, it's it's enabled me to be involved with a game which I love and have enjoyed for all my since I was a wee lad. Did you plan leaving the same time as Sir Alex, or how did that happen? Did you talk to him first, or no? Well, I, well, I, you know, so no, I, I I sort of decided. So I told him in in January of that year, and then you know, and he decided thereafter. I think he clearly, you know, I think he discussed it with his family and you know and. Uh, Determined that he wanted to go out with success, and we clearly had a successful season in terms of the league, etc., which he clearly deserved. And it's, he's much more important for him to choose his own timing of leaving than me. And I think that was that's that's how it happened. Uh, very a, a few people have said it was the wrong to go both go at the same time, etc. But it is what it is. We've got to look forward now. Did uh, Mr. Woodward ever contact you for advice when he took over? Uh, not a lot. But he, yeah, some, some, yeah, occasionally I was there for him and I was, I was conscious because it's quite different. You know, you, normally a CEO, 
you know, finishes at the company and, and you know moves on. The, the, the family wanted Glazer to keep me as a director because I was still involved. And I was, got my UEFA role there and then, and I was still involved with the FA at the time. So yeah, Ed did. But again, I think um, I wouldn't, uh, you know, and I was available. But I think he wanted to plough his own furrow and also, uh, how should we put it? You know, um, it was comfortable in what he was doing. So we did, we, we had a handover because effectively, so I did introductions to him, say from the January through to the June when I left with agents and certain things like that. But, you know, so, you know, I think he uh, he was comfortable with, with what he was doing when I was available. How have you seen the post yourself and Alex Ferguson era of Manchester United? It's been difficult I'm a, as a fan as well to watch and yeah. to, to be a part of. Yeah, it's been very difficult and it's been very disappointing. And I think, you know, the, 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 the football's only got bigger in that time as we've seen, whether it be, you know, the, the, the investments coming in, the growth of the game in terms of media revenues and growth of the Champions League, the Premier League, etc. And I, well, I say, you know, it goes back to the point, the early part of the discussion, it's all about the players. And I think, you know, if you're honest about it, the recruitment's been disappointing. Mm. It's been disappointing. It's not, uh, if you look at the players and the investment, the amount of the investment, the club has put money into players, you know, you know over the years. And, uh, and it's, um, you know, but, you know, for, for whatever reason, not got the right players. I don't know if it's the structure, the scouting, the negotiations or whatever. It's had some disappointing buys, it has some successful buys, but more often, you know, a lot of them been disappointing in mm -hmm. terms of the standards we're at. If you've had so much success over the years, Surely there's, there should be more communication. Like, for example, I work for you, right? Yeah. If I was going into a, an area that he had more knowledge in, mm. I would reach out, mm. you know, mm. probably mm. regularly. Especially mm. you guys are like, from the outside looking in, Man United's like a family club, mm. right? As right. big as it is. Mm -hmm. For me, it makes more sense for me to like reach out to Rio and hopefully you would, you would advise, right? Mm. Yeah, but I think that you've got to be comfortable in your own skin doing that, and I think you know, things move on. And so it's not for lack of avail availability; it's for people to determine that was there, and they would change some of the, mm. um, change some of the approach. And as we've seen that today. I read about, or the other day, I read about Liverpool's replacement of Jurgen Klopp. It's going to be very data driven. Well, data has become much more prevalent in football today. They have XGs and all this sort of stuff. Oh, I don't understand it all. Steve loves it. Yeah, anyway, right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but they have all these things, and it, it's changed. So the game has moved on. So you know, and I think. Yeah, I, the last player deal I did um, with Alex was, you know, Wilf Sahar yeah, from yeah. from Palace in in January thirteen. Mm -hmm. So that's the last time I dealt with an agent. I don't know, how, you know, and all these things. It's, it's, I assume that's moved on and these sort of things. So I don't disagree with the point you're making, but again, mm -hmm. you know, you've got to move with the times, and football in particular is a very you know, fast moving environment, and therefore you've got to be cognizant of you know who the you know who who the moves and shakers now versus then, and, and deal with it. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right, so my 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 overall riding thing is you know Manchester United. It's um, you know is is you know, as I say, it's been a disappointing ten years. Let's be honest. You know, in terms of achievement, particularly you know with the, the teams who've done well in our at our, at our uh, cost. But yeah, it's, it's not a lack of investment. I think looking looking at the quality of that investment, and mm -hmm. it goes back to the um, some of it. I think is around. The type of player, you know, we bought, you know, the, you know, we were always very much looking at people like you when you came in or Ronaldo or you know, uh, Wayne, the young players who you know, were clearly the best in class, so to speak, in their particular area. And we could then look to uh, work with them and, and give them a great career for, you know, t eight, 10, 15 years or whatever mm -hmm. the case may be. Yeah. And, and that, that's what we're all about. And we're, Alex was much more motivated and working with young players and, and and Robin was effective. I think he was possibly, well, Edwin, slightly different for goalkeeper, clearly. But I think Robin Van Persie was the oldest player we bought, you know, yeah, when, 29, he was 29 something, yeah. when we bought him, you know, and that was the oldest we'd ever bought since I was in there. So, wow. but I think Manchester United's got a lot of great strengths. I think we've got a new investment coming in with um, Sir Jim Ratcliffe. Uh, Dave Brails was looking at the club, so I think there's a bit of momentum there now, and a bit of uh, hopefully it's a catalyst for change. Great segue, because my next question I'm just sitting here queuing up is <laughs> Omar Barada starts mm. as the new CEO of Manchester United very soon. What is the first thing on his inbox that he needs to get sorted? 
Uh, firstly, I think you know, I think it's a, I think it's a good idea they've appointed from outside. I think someone coming in with with some new ideas and a new perspective coming from a you know, clearly a very successful club. Yeah, the the first thing that I got in, and I think you've seen it in some of the some of the announcements, is to really, you know, focus in with um, Dave Brailsford and whomever on that side is on the whole recruitment, scouting, negotiation side. You know, to get that under understand that, get a focus back on that, or rather focus, get that sort of hopefully working better to actually then deliver those players we've got because. Yeah, there's some great teams. You know, they've just negotiated an extension of the Adidas deal. You know, superb deal they've done there, um, and they've got other sponsors coming in all the time. So that I think is working pretty well. But if you then ally that with a great team performance, it's going to go even better. You know, what they're doing on so areas like digital, I think, is fine. So, you know, his fo- if I was coming in, my focus would be, you know, what do an audit, what's gone wrong in the past, and how do we put it right? And once you've got that, you can then build it out and get that because. If you look at it, and Rio would know through Carrington, or I walk around Old Trafford. There's so many people there. Every football club has people who've who've worked there for many, many years. Uh, you know, love the club and they want to get there. And they just need a bit of hope. They just need a bit of you know aspiration, and they see that coming back. So that will then galvanise them into working, you know, harder and more motivated. And you know, that's to me really what um, is needed. So that would be if, if I, my intro, I would be doing that, and then basically getting back to the philosophy that you know that. We're, we're sort of all one club and I you know for me management is about as a CEO you know I would uh, you know it's treating everyone the same as I you know I, you know, I, I, I can say I've, throughout my career I've seen people who can manage laterally and upwards but it, the, the ability of a good manager is to manage downwards to get on with people who are you know doing it in the ticket office or in the, you know doing the electricity or you know all that work and, and it's, it's that sort of thing, and I think if you can get that in and show that sort of, you know, empathy, so to speak, with all the, all, with all the employees, it, it, it'll make a great start. In 2004, you said that... I world. didn't, actually. This is, Did no, one has, no one has shown me... Another one you got wrong. No, Jesus, what's no, going on here? No one showed but you're right, I'm a quota to that. I, right, I, right, I, okay. wouldn't, I wouldn't say... No one's done that. And I remember seeing it, I think it was at Wolves, actually, and put the debt is a road to it and said, Gil. So we got a lot of grief over that. Okay, okay. But... Carry the debt on. Manchester United have had for the last 18 years under the Glazer ownership, that's been problematic, would you agree? The, 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 I think the, uh, the capital structure, from we went from a debt-free con- company or club to one with debt, has been you know, has, has, um, brought certain challenges. But I, what I would say is, and uh, you know, people don't necessarily believe Alex and I on this, and all the time we were there uh, together with the Glazers from 05, to, to 2013, they never ever said no on a player or anything like that. It didn't preclude us from spending money there. Now that's not to say, you know, looking forward, you know, the, the debt and the interest costs, you know, clearly, you know, have some implications or have some ramifications. Yes, but all I can say is, whilst I didn't, agree, you know, I, I said I, I, I don't. No one can show me I ever said that. That's not to say I wouldn't have used it as part of a negotiation or part of the discussion around the takeover that. You know, going from a debt-free club to a club with debt has some ramifications, has some issue. Well, I didn't say it was a road to ruin. I wouldn't have stayed if I felt it was a road to ruin. Um, but nonetheless, you know, we, we sort of, you know, the Glazers, you know, in my opinion, gave us what we wanted. Now that's not to say I, don't, I haven't been around close to it, in the, you know, from 2013 onwards. But that's what it. That's what it's at. Does does the debt? Because we, the capital debt is more or less what it was mm. in 2005. Mm. And the interest payments have been somewhere in the region of 1.6 billion mm, in the last 18 mm, years. Mm, mm. That would be a whole squad of 100 million pound players potentially. Mm. Yeah. Do any of us need to fix that first and foremost to move forward with the club? Well, I think it. I think what any of us need to do, which they are doing, is doing that audit and understanding what all, all the football structures and all of that. And I think if you get that right, you will be in a position whereby they can start to improve the performance on the pitch. Um, get the returns in and start to look at it, and the capital structure may or may not be within that. But certainly, you know, I think, you know, I would. The money's one side of it, and, and the capital structure, but the actual organisational structure and the people you got in those slots in those positions and how that's all worked out. So I was saying, well, how can we bought that player? Who looked at that player? What was the scouting? You know, how did that all work out? How who negotiated it? And all those sort of things to be looked at. Have you seen the reports recently that we valued? the likes of Anthony at different prices and still went with the... I think that's just sort of examples of what you was talking about, really. 
Yeah, I, I think you've got to, those questions got to be asked. To be honest, I, mean, I don't know the answers. I've, I've seen the reports, but I've um, you know I'm always slightly skeptical what's written in papers on football. But I I, I don't disagree <coughs> with the with the point you're making, and I think that's that's you know that, that that's to me you know you, you, until you identify the problem and understand what's caused it, you haven't got a chance of fixing it. So hopefully that will happen, and 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 uh, they will be in a position whereby you know better decisions are made going forward. But it's you know, it's never, you know, it's, it's, Alex Ferguson made some, you know, not so successful signings, but it's a portfolio approach because it's not like buying a machine that, you know, is going to churn out so many cars per hour or whatever. It's, you know, buying a human asset that, you know, you think will fit into your team, but then it all comes down to personality, ability, this, that, and the other. It doesn't always work out. So it's, you've got to get more right than wrong and the ones you get wrong and hopefully the ones you spent less money on because you never know what, you know, you buy a player for 30 million, it's never the right amount. Some players are worth 60 and some are worth nothing. You know, it's rarely worth around that 30 million. I don't think any managers oh, well. ever had to deal with <laughs> the issues that we've had just in the right wing position alone with Greenwood, yeah. with Anthony, with Sancho. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's yeah, chaos, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah no, uh, you see them situations there. I, mean, I know you're not going to go too deep into it, but like, in terms of like, we're seeing so much come out of the club at the moment that's negative yeah. and it's almost like a soap opera. Yeah. How do you manage that something like that and, 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 and bring it all back into the, 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 the machine to stay in there and, be, and, and become that place where it's not siege mentality, but where it's a unified approach, looking approach, which is very much not at the moment? But I think, you know, I think it's a difficult position that because if we were doing better, I think less would come out, you know, mm. doing better on the pitch. But I think the whole proliferation of media outlets and media coverage on football has gone through it's the roof, Rio. So you know, I, I, you know, what we had to deal with in 2013 was a lot less than you have to do today. Mm. And I generally have to look at what's happening in our own, Manchester's own digital you know, assets. You know, I'm getting notifications on my thing. What's out of training today? Or you know, getting everything two minutes. You know, and, uh, who you know who's who's arriving at the ground for the game? You think <laughs> someone, someone interested in this? <laughs> but, yeah, they clearly are. <laughs> but, uh, right, so I think it's difficult, and but I think it comes down to, you know, to me, you know, you know, from an executive side, you know, I would be getting my executive team together and saying that you know you've got to impress upon you know the importance of confidentiality and being proper to the club, and then mm. on the football side, the manager presumably and his staff trying to sort of you know. Tell the players about that, but you know, players will go back, speak to their agents, and it's not necessarily the players who spoken to the press or their agents are speaking mm. to another person. So, I think you've got to be, you know, without doubt, you know, you know, you don't see as much coming out of City or Liverpool with having a better season and things mm. like that. We have to get back to having doing well, doing better, and, and I think there would be less less negative stories. I mean, you said the same thing, really. You said yeah. like you weren't an angel, you would say, but you you kind of knew there was awareness. You yeah. know, you knew when to step out, when yeah. when to not yeah. step in, and mm. obviously Sir Alex yeah. Ferguson yeah, had you, eyes and ears everywhere. Yeah, you you just knew, as a player, that there are the right times and the wrong times to go out. Mm. But we had a a manager that if you did go out at the wrong time, you knew there mm. was no hiding place. Mm. Like Mr. Gill said, it's black and white of him. Mm. You shouldn't mm. be out. What are you doing out? Fine. Mm. Like in <laughs> and the paperwork will come from Mr. Gill. Oh really? <laughs> but, it would, um, mm. but it'd be like it seems there maybe isn't that kind of authoritative figure there. No, I moment. agree. But that comes down from the dressing room and understanding and, and, and all of that. But I get a silly little anecdote, or not an example is, you know, I'm reading about uh, the, the Sir Bobby Charlton stand leaking roof. Mm. Trust me, that roof leaked when we were there. But we had to be top of the league. So it's not mm. mentioned in the papers or the media. You know, it leaked. Mm. I mean, you know, perhaps it leaks a bit more now, I don't know. But all I'm saying, <laughs> so those sort of things, you know, success, you know, covers up a lot of issues. And I think we just got to get back to that. And I think, you know, that whole, you know, Perhaps over the year, last few years, the club's been drifting, and I think this whole focus now with new ownership, you know, or new new part, partial ownership taking over the football side, will really hopefully galvanise everyone in the club, the fans, to say let's get behind it. New ideas, this new appointment you mentioned of Barada, uh, and, and you know that's it is an opportunity to get back to being you know a proper family club, you know, which which a lot of football clubs are. I hasten to add, with, with that sort of real motivation. So Jim Radcliffe and um, David Brasford, I mean, all the fans want to know what they're like. Mm. Are they the right people? Mm. You've obviously had a little bit of yeah. time with those guys. Yeah. What do you see in those that could become a group that becomes successful? Well, I think, yeah, I think that 
Dave Browse was doing an audit at the moment with Jean-Claude Blanc, and I don't know Dave Browse for that much. I met him a few times, but I know Jean-Claude Blanc. He was um, at Juventus and then PSG, and that he's, he's an experienced executive in the football world and mm -hmm. uh, knows what works and what doesn't work, I think. So that's, you know, that's positive. And I think, you know, Brailsford has shown, albeit in slightly different sports, you know, that he's a winner as well. And I think he will leave no stone unturned and seeing, you know, for example, what's happened with this appointment, they're, they're prepared to act quickly. It's got to get approved by the Premier League, but they're prepared to act quickly. And they understand, you know, that, um, that uh, uh, we have to win. You're not guaranteed it, but we have to win and get mm. that into everyone. And you know, you know, coming the old, the, the latter days of Arsenal, where with Arsenal, you know, and they're saying Champions League is acceptable. We'll get into the top three or four to get in the Champions League. That was deemed to be acceptable. And the old run in the cup. Well, that's not good enough. You know, I don't think it's good enough for Arsenal in fairness, but also, you know, for us, we've got to get back. We've got to get you know, qualify for the Champions League is. Uh, you know, uh, at the minimum. Uh, yeah, I mean, it should, we should be that. We should be up there challenging. You might, like Liverpool, might miss out on the league, the city by a point or a goal difference, but at least you've been there right until the death. Mm. And that's what we want, mm. isn't it? Mm. And so, so I think, and, and Jim Ratcliffe, clearly a very, very wealthy man. You know, he's very successful business. He's now got into sport. He's obviously got a passion for certain sports. And I think he, you know, you have to speak to him, but clearly, um, uh, you know, just just over seventy, and he wants to enjoy his money. And I think he, you know, the fact he's from the area, um, I think again, he's got to be uh, look, looked at positively. Mm. There are a lot of very good people at Manchester United. I mean, you know, it's not as if we have to get rid of you know, all these people. There are some very good people at Manchester United. I just think they need a new direction and a new motivation and Gardens. a new a new um, how should we put it, you know. Um, outlook and I think we, we've got that so I am positive but the proof will be in the, in the pudding and in, in the eating. Off United for a second although it's not Good. entirely off us. <laughs> <laughs> the pressure's off now. Yeah. Yeah. Is the European Super League still a threat? No. No I think personally well, I think that was it, quick. It, that was a quick answer. No no I don't think it will be because of the, I, don't, I don't think the economics are there. What, what I see is that you know and I've seen it a bit within UEFA is that there's a, there was this court decision back in just before Christmas um, about you know the, which the Super League clubs have brought, and you know I think reading that I think over time there will be the clubs will get more control um, of some of the competitions they play in, i.e. you know at the moment so for example the the Champions League format changes from next from 24-25 onwards there's now a joint venture set up between the clubs and UEFA, mm. uh, and so I see it within UEFA there's more uh, input, so to speak, and more control and more involvement, which is probably right by the clubs. If I was at Manchester United, I'd want that on that. So I see more of that going forward. But I don't, I don't think the you know uh, Super League will come around. I think there's, I don't, I don't think there's much appetite as that. I'd be interested to see what all the Saudi money does because I think that's another another um, interesting development in the world of football, world of sport generally, but football as well. And so, but I don't, I don't you know, see that as a threat now. Um, but Saudi I wouldn't be complacent, by the way. I wouldn't. I, if I was UEFA, I'd be looking at the, you know, speaking to the clubs, continue involved them, make sure we're developing the competitions. And I think this new Swiss league next year, we'll see how it works. But at least is trying to address and look at you know, what what the club competition needs to do. I was going to say Saudi a threat, but I'm going to rephrase that and just say, is there a possibility of Saudi getting a place inside UEFA? No, no chance. Again, really quick. Yeah, no chance. He's involved. He's in the. I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's no at chance. the table. He's, yeah, he's yeah, leader yeah, of the table. Yeah. No. No. No chance. <laughs> Has that been raised? No. No. That's not. Yeah. No. I. I, I just don't think so. I think there's. You know, the economics are such, and the way it's worked out. I think. You know. That's. Uh, you know. I, I just can't see that happening. Now, that's not to say Saudi and you know the money they've got the World Cup in thirty four in all probability, the money they're playing. You know, there's, that's would be interesting how all that develops because, you know, it's. Uh, Whilst it's not direct, you know, clearly if some players can go from earning a hell of a lot of money in the UK to there for even more money, mm. you know, what the impact that has. You know, mm. Whether the younger players will start to go, I don't know, you might get a player going at 24, five years at Saudi, makes a great money and then comes back and plays in Europe. I don't know mm. whether he can develop as much. But, so. but I think all, what I would say is, I don't say it that, but that's not to say I've got all the answers or know everything, but I think that, you know, the authorities, the leagues and the FA should be discussing it and seeing what the implications are. Yeah, we, you know, we've seen that in other sports, what they're doing. Just like in the movie before, so, uh, mm -hmm. um, before Mr. Gill goes, I think we've, yeah. we've been a bit serious, haven't we? Yeah. He's been on, he's on like that at the back, yeah. of, his, the back of the chair. No, no, no. But he's a um, couple of quick fire ones. Best top three signings. 
where you see a... Don't say Rio. I can't Rio, because it's not the case, <laughs> so, yeah. Not including me. No, the, the top three signings, I would say, would be uh, well, Wayne, mm. in terms of what he did for the club. Mm. I would say Michael Carrick, for what he brought in terms of uh, all that. And then, uh, yeah, I would say either, well, I can have two. Uh, uh, well, there's a lot, Vidic and Evra. Mm. Oh, I thought, yeah, I thought yeah, I've, them two I thought would have been first. Yeah. Okay, cool. But I think in terms of the importance of the club, the world was, the club was uh, I think one of the most important ones was Edwin, because we'd always, we'd, we struggled to replace, uh, replace Peter, and then we went out and got Edwin, and that, you know, that, you know, for, he was great for us for a, a Did few years. Did Sir Alex have a, have a regret about not signing him immediately after Pitch Michael? Don't think so. Well, he probably did, but he didn't. Wouldn't say that to me. <laughs> I don't know. No. I thought Edwin would have come here and be CEO. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Could you? Could you? I don't know that? about that. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I think he, he he certainly had that that presence and things like that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So hardest, a, hardest player to work with. Uh, well, you know the answer, don't you? Who? Oh, no, no. Uh, Gary. <laughs> Gary. <laughs> Why? Why is he yeah, so yeah. difficult to work with? Well, no, no, he don't he, stop he, talking. Uh, no, he doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. All in all, they're all. Yeah, no, no. It's, it's fine. I think they're all. Yeah, it's 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 like anything, you know. It, the, the most important thing is you had individuals. They all, all have personality, so we're mm. gonna have issues. You know, mm. they sort of probably hard to deal with, but you know, you you, you they want Man United to do well. So mm. no, I don't think. Yeah, Gary probably. Who else? Does Daniel leave his reputation? as being difficult to work with um, valid? I think he's protecting his club. So is that part way of saying yes? But you respect yeah. it, no? Yeah, you respect, respect him. Respect I thought he's good. I liked him. And what he's done with that stadium is fantastic and things like that. But yeah, he was clearly... He was clearly... Uh, he was clearly no uh, one goes Spurs and gets a deal, do they? Yeah. No, no. And I think he may... You know, and I think he's... You know, he can not do himself any favours. I'll give you an example of that. You know, when we bought we, we, Dimitar, we were, had him all summer. We ended up sort of, um, you know, right at the desk getting him, and but he had no replacement. So Fraser Campbell was going on loan to Bolton, I think it was. Alex had to ring him up saying, "By the way, no, you're not going on loan to Bolton. You're going to Tottenham." Mm. <laughs> so but my point being that, you know, Daniel probably got another million or two out of us. I forget the figures, but uh, I don't. But I'm not telling you. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, and 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 uh, and. Uh, <laughs> And he could have got that, say, three weeks earlier or two weeks earlier, and he can then have a, you know, perhaps a different replace. Nothing against Fraser Campbell, but you know, that's, my, that's what mm. I'm trying to say. And I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really, to your point, I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm positive about the future. I think we, we, we can do it. Things are going in cycles, and you know, I think we're, we, 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 you know, the first part of, you know, getting back up is to address the problems and understand them, and then you can start working on them. And I think we're doing that. Well, what a way to finish. Positivity, I like that. I love that. Manager is about to right. now. Thank right. you very much, Mr. Gill. Pleasure. Lovely to see you.